core workflows, RPA, and then put AI on top of it, especially Gen AI gets super exciting. It's now giving us more tools to address more automation. At some point, hopefully things become more autonomous. The one thing that fascinated me about Gen AI since the beginning is its ability to understand users' intent. I've spent 20, 25 years building web-based products. Getting the intuitive user experience is so difficult um, and that's why we spend so many iterations of product keep tweaking keep tweaking to get it right the low-tech individual can just have a simple conversation and this tool simply understands what the user is trying to do i am surajit chatterjee ceo and founder of emma I'm here today with Mahi Anampodi. Mahi is CTO of Onfire Global. Onfire Global is the market leader in global immigration and services. And they help companies all over the world hire and manage international workforce. Mahi has over 20 years of experience uh, in technology, particularly building disruptive technology for really fast growing enterprises. Welcome, Mahi. Thank you. Nice to be here. So glad to, to have you here. You have been one of our earliest customers and a pioneer in Gen AI. So I have some really tough questions for you today. <laughs> All right, sounds good. If you can tell us a little bit about kind of the most interesting challenges you have in your role at, at Envoy, and maybe a little bit more about what Envoy does as well. You talked about Envoy. We do corporate immigration services. Uh, we cover most of the countries. For the folks that are not familiar with immigration, a lot of parallels with tax or even mortgage too. That means a ton of forms, lots of paperwork in this case it's complicated law and when you talk about 20 30 different countries and their immigration policies and laws it just gets really really complicated for someone at the uh, corporation typically it's hr that's managing immigration program it just gets really complicated when you have a large workforce hundreds of or even thousands of employees on some kind of visa you have to maintain the status and be compliant and renewals on time, et cetera, et cetera. It goes beyond the spreadsheets or Outlook reminders. Always wanted to combine the best of tech and best of lawyering to give the best service to our HR customers. That's the immigration um, services business. What gets really interesting on the tech side of it is the crux of it it's really about automation. Our vision on the tech side had always been automate every task every for every role that's involved in this immigration platform. So starting with the HR user that's initiating, monitoring, planning, um, the foreign national that's going through the visa, uh, attorneys, paralegals, all users on the customer side as well as on the back end side of things. So how do we automate their work? Um, free up their time to um, do the lawyering and <laughs> and handle the cases. So that's that's the that's the vision. So it's a lot of paperwork. That's paperwork. Complex, but real implications for people yeah. involved. Right? You yeah. need to be correct. Yeah. Because it's people's lives, their their immigration status, their their livelihood. Sometimes sounds messy. In, in this situation, you know, how do you think about where AI can drive value, particularly generative AI? There's a lot of talk about generative AI driving value, you know, improving productivity. I was building on the automation I just started talking about. Every tech person had been talking about automation for almost two, three decades now. At the foundation level, you got the web platform creating the workflow um, for various users involved, as it was talking about HR for national, you know, the back inside attorneys and our users. Automated around 2,000 plus workflows uh, for various country immigration. That's one level of digital transformation that's foundational. And then we built RPA, came along a few years ago, and that brought in an additional level of automation for the tasks, hundreds of tasks that are still done manually. We had been chipping away at it. We now have a robust RPA program. There is this segment of the workflow we could never attend with technology. Generally, their language tasks or customer Q&As or even decisions for that matter. We think AI is another foundation layer, um, architectural building block on top of core workflows, RPA, and then put AI on top of it, especially Gen AI gets super exciting. It's, it's now giving us more tools to address more automation. 
um, at some point, hopefully, things become more autonomous uh, and freeing up people to be, um, you know, address human concerns, um, uh, especially in immigration. Um, we were talking earlier too. The foreign national that's going through it, generally there are masters in computer science or MBA or top degrees. Um, they are stuck with nuances of immigration and their visa status. Throwing more paper at them is not the solution. So how do you how do you create the transparency using technology? Sometimes it's talking to the attorney that puts the foreign national at um, at peace more right. than you know any of the technology. So. Um, going back to the best of attorneys and the best of tech, um, we think AI gives us another tool uh, to chip away at the automation towards autonomous way. And that, that's a very interesting point, right? You don't want to lose the human touch. Absolutely. Right, but you want to use technology to serve the customer better, the exactly. users. In your automation journey, you talked about RPA and then you know more recently using AI or exploring AI. How do you think about like ROI of AI in particular? Because the, this this new generation of AI is a little bit different yeah. than than how say RPAs will work, which which is very fixed and and very deterministic. AI is a little bit non-deterministic. How do you think about ROI and you know how do you actually kind of manage this transformation for your organization? AI is going to be very different, and especially Gen AI. I think is very different from anything we have ever done. Historically, we have coded for, you know, x plus y equal to z as a formula, and you punch in the numbers, you always get the exact same answer every single time. With Gen AI, it could be different. It, it's like you ask me this question today, uh, three days later, if you ask me the exact same question, I'm going to be generally around the same theme, but my words and the language, and it's going to be slightly different and. Gen AI is very different, you know, very identical to it's mimicking human. In that scenario, the answer it might give today could be very different from the answer it gives two days later. So, um, the metrics we have used for tech forever um, need to be tweaked, and the adoption-wise, users need to understand that Gen AI is very different and treat Gen AI application more like their assistance or a tool that's assisting them rather than uh, a tool that's automating what they're trying to do be because it's very different from RPA or even web workflows we've built for decades now. In terms of measuring ROI, I think it's more to do with what Mahi is able to do in a day rather than um, is Gen AI getting the answer right every single time. I hope we all start to view Gen AI more as, is it freeing up the 20% of admin work that you don't need to um, spend too much of your brain cells on, uh, but rather free that up to work on something else or um, think through things deeper. That's something we need to find ways to free up. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily automating my job every single area, but freeing up my time to do something, something Higher more value. more fruitful yeah, yeah, yeah. for my life and yeah, probably in the yeah. job itself. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, very well said, and you have been a thought leader in this. So let me ask you kind of a, another question that I am very curious about. You talked about, you know, how this generation of AI uh, is mimicking human, right? Now, as you, if you kind of keep think, uh, take it a few years ahead, like it's going to mimic humans more and more. How do you think about like? budgets for this generation of technology? Would you be looking at it transcending the IT budget and looking at personnel budget, right? How do you think about that? Anything you can move out of tech budget these days, I guess, there is a good thing. <laughs> There's more focus these days, especially this tech-centric recession that we've been going through the last two, three years. Every tech budget is shrinking. Um, that is the reality. But irrespective, so shifting to people budget, probably something becomes the norm four or five years from now, but we gotta get, get this engine going. I'm primarily looking at, at this point, it, it is part of tech budget. Um, until we prove out the value, then hopefully one day transitions to the larger organization. I look at it is simply, what's the problem we're trying to solve, what could whether it's AI or not, what could this technology solution could improve um, and do an ROI in that case. If the problem is big enough, 
um, we could find money for even even with tight budgets too for Gen AI applications. Like I was saying earlier, that that mind shift and embracing Gen AI as an assistant helping me free up my time. Um, hopefully that expands uh, the applications, number one, number two. Where should this sit in terms of budgeting? Hopefully it becomes a non-issue and maybe there's another day is not too far when people are talking about, I got 30 people and 20 bots or 20 agents. Let me turn to Emma a little bit. You know, you have been one of our earliest customers and very thankful for that. What made Emma stand out in your mind as you are going through the process of evaluating different technologies? As you know, we didn't start with Emma. We started with a particular problem we'd been trying to solve when ChatGPT came in the news and we all got so excited about it. And um, same for us, we got excited too. We started exploring and I think a few months later, Azure announced OpenAI and some of our developers, we started playing around with it. Um, we thought we could build something that could address uh, customer q and In immigration space, it gets really tricky because a specific question you ask Mahi, you ask the exact same question to Surajit, answer might be very different uh, because of the immigration context and the data for Mahi's profile might be very different for you. So it's not just about content, knowledge base centric um, AI chatbot. We got excited, we started playing with it. We could build it and it started producing many times good answers, but as long as they were simplistic in nature, content-based um, understanding of the content and answers, um, it did really, really well. Um, but as it gets more complicated with the context of the user and additional things, um, it was not so good. And I do not have too many AI engineers. Um, many did not have <laughs> a year ago either, uh, especially Gen AI side of things. I have no intention of competing with any of the large companies that are throwing money at AI skill right now. It's such a competitive market for AI skill. Um, we decided this is not for us. I would rather focus on our problems and let someone else figure out the models for us and apply those models for solving our problems. So we started exploring third parties and that's that's how I got introduced to Emma. I probably had four options at the time. You talk to them 10 minutes into it and you realize we know more than them. I was not too um, optimistic when we started talking first time and um, 10 minutes into the conversation, um, you know, my team and I felt there, there is something here. The team was very impressive. Um, so we kept doing, and a few weeks later, we were talking about the nuances of, you know, our business to solve problems. So that, that's how that's how we got in touch with you guys. Tell me a little bit more about that journey. Like, how has Emma helped you solve your challenges? How was the experience in setting it up and, and deploying? Most people we were talking to at that time were talking about VectorDB and you know the basics of LLM. The exciting thing with your team was we got through all those things really, really quick. And we quickly got down to um, what's our use case and how do we solve it. Um, within weeks, we had something up and running when we were looking at the accuracy and how do we measure it and um, what's our KPI. Uh, that was really, really exciting for me, honestly. When you get with the solution and get that far so quickly, um, because Gen AI, unlike other things, it's very, very easy to get to something up and running. The challenge is always the long tail. How do you fine tune it? Go go back again and again and again. Somebody get, says like the, it's two hours to make a demo, two years yeah. to get to value. I mean, I was, I, was, um, I was helping my daughter last week. She wants to build a WebMD-based <laughs> Gen AI tool. We were playing with Notebook LM. It takes, so she's seventh grader, it's drag and drop and you start chatting. That part is the easiest thing. The more complicated thing is, you know, you have hundreds and thousands of historical questions. How does it perform against them? Then the fine tuning the models, we started looking for partners to help. Within, I think, if I remember right, three or four months into it, we were, we had the metrics uh, we were looking at. Um, our target was could we get to 50% coverage, meaning if you throw 100 questions at it, 
could it answer 50 questions at 90% plus accuracy levels? With test systems, we were talking about those kind of numbers, which was super exciting. As you know, we just deployed and we got the latest version of Emma framework last week, which we are super excited. So we are now tracking production numbers um, and how do we compare those with uh, human agent answers as well. Very excited to be here. Yeah, Thank you for getting us this far. Of course, very, very thankful for the partnership. Now I have a couple of more questions, maybe a little bit more broader now, like you have this experience and you made this journey. You know, one of the, I would say, pioneers in, in this space now in, in generative AI, actually deploying something in production in a complex use case, right? It's not a simple use case. Very high bar, regulated industry, all of that. Where do you see the future of generative AI in the enterprise in general? I think in a couple of years, we'll get through the use cases we talk about today. They'll become the norm. The one thing that fascinated me about Gen AI since beginning is its ability to understand users' intent. I spent 20, 25 years building web-based products. Getting the intuitive user experience is so difficult. That's why we spend so many iterations of product, keep tweaking, keep tweaking to get it right. And understanding what the user is expecting. Exactly. Right. That's, um, that's the hard part. And suddenly, there is this thing that has no UI and just simply understands in the most natural conversational, um, which is for us, um, the low-tech individual can just have a simple conversation and this tool simply understands what the user is trying to do. Um, I really hope these agentic orchestrators translate that into performing the task on the back end without a ton of UI. That's the best uh, thing we could do on the tech side. My hope is this agentic orchestrators, so far the conversation is more about AI talking to AI and models and everything, but um, I really hope this Gen AI disrupts from within, meaning we spent 20 years building all kinds of tech you know, everything from ERP to um, custom web workflows like us. Um, could we build, you know, there are a ton of APIs for everything. There are bots now, RPA. Could Gene AI interact with all these different technologies that are existing in enterprise and get the task done for me? Simplistic example for this event, if my Outlook or some agent sitting in my inbox, you know, oh, okay, Mahi signed up for this event. If it asks me, do you want me to schedule this flight for you? Do you want me to schedule a hotel for you? If I just say yes, based on my, imagine that, that's 30 minutes for me, right? Uh, that I don't need to uh, spend otherwise. So I hope it's, it gets smart enough to interface with all other existing technologies. I think that'll be super powerful. I can't wait for it. That's our hope as well as a company, <laughs> we're building AI employees to help humans in every, every role in the enterprise in the future. What advice would you give my to um, CTOs, uh, you know, chief AI officers, exploring agentic AI today? Some of them are still on the fence, some of them are, are trying things out, building on their own. What adv advice would you give them? My advice would be not to look at from how do I use AI, but start with a problem that's been bothering the business for a while. Is it going to give you a competitive advantage or is it going to solve a problem that you never had the ability to solve? Um, chase those use cases and map it to AI. Um, then things will happen. Then you have a lot more engagement from the actual, whether it's your employees or your customers, um, because there is an ROI you're chasing. That gets more exciting for everyone. Rather than looking at Gen AI and trying to insert it into AI. Focus on the outcome, exactly. not on the technology. Exactly, yeah. As long as we keep focusing on the outcome and keep using Gen AI or other AI, any technology for that matter, as a tool to get us there, I think that'll be a lot more exciting and reception from employees and customers as well. Very well said. Thank you so much for, for your time today. And thanks for the amazing partnership we have and looking forward to working with you. Of course. Your team for many other use cases and opportunities. Mm -hmm.